Bon tardi. Good afternoon, everyone. I have been asked to present to you in less than 15 minutes <laughs> the importance of our incredible biodiversity, the numerous challenges that we as conservationists face on a tiny Caribbean island like Aruba, but also the opportunities we see amidst and despite these challenges. Did you know that the Caribbean holds numerous nature records? The world's smallest bird, five centimeters large or tiny, the bee hummingbird. The world's smallest snake, only 10.8 centimeters small. And then we also have the world's smallest lizard, a dwarf gecko, 16 millimeters small. And as more and more species are identified, world records are being broken thick and fast. So as conservationists, we are often asked the question, why should we care? Why does nature matter? Well, the Caribbean islands support an incredible biodiversity within its terrestrial ecosystems with a high percentage of endemicity. And endemicity means that species occur in a specific geographical range. And they're usually confined to a single area. So that makes this region one of the world's greatest centers of biodiversity. Did you also know that the Caribbean is in the top six of the world's 36 biodiversity hotspots? So biodiversity hotspots make up less than 3% of the Earth's land surface and refer to regions that are both rich in life and at a high risk for destruction. Biodiversity hotspots are by definition in a conservation crisis. To be classified as a biodiversity hotspot, a region must have at least lost 70% of its original natural vegetation, usually due to human activity. So the ABC Islands, St. Martin, St. Stacia and Seba, stand out within the Kingdom of the Netherlands as the most significant biodiversity hotspot. The Caribbean is also a hotbed for endemism. But endemism is a double-edged sword. While an animal is well adapted to life on its particular island, this does, not make, this does make it very vulnerable to environmental change. And with the 35 million strong human population on the Caribbean islands growing at a rate of 2.5% each year, change is inevitable. So Barbados, St. Martin, and Aruba are not only among the most densely populated islands within the Caribbean, they also are amongst the most densely populated islands or countries in the world. I will not go through the entire list, but I hope you have scanned and are impressed by how amazing the Caribbean really is. So Aruba's biodiversity is also unique. It's surprisingly rich despite its semi-arid semi environment and being heavily impacted by centuries of human activity. On Aruba, there are 34 endemic species, species that occur only on Aruba and nowhere else on Earth. There are also 28 species that the ABC Islands share together, and there are 37 species that the ABC Islands share with a part of Colombia and a part of Venezuela. Now, Aruba is truly unique. I don't know if everyone realizes that. So we also have 10 species of tern that together nest on our islands, our reef islands. And this is probably the only place on Earth where 10 species of tern nest together. Our reef islands are breeding grounds to approximately 25% population of the Cayenne tern, 90%, and that was, sorry, that was the global population of the Cayenne tern, 90% of the Caribbean population of the common tern, and 25% of the Caribbean population of the Black Noddy. It is special, believe me. A further four species of sea turtle nest on our beaches, of which most of, uh, of which we know from the uh, research done on the leatherback turtle, that Aruba brings forth a higher ratio of male turtles 
supplementing the higher female ratio on the other islands. And there are seven species of bats that call Aruba their home, in, not only insectivorous bats, but also frugivorous bats or nectar-feeding bats. And together, these, these bats do an amazing work because without the nectar-feeding bats, we probably wouldn't have a, as many cacti on the island, which make Aruba so characteristic. But also, did you know that the insectivorous bats eat around 600 to 1,000 bugs every hour, so they help us. So, okay. This incredibly cute bird is the crested bobwhite, known locally as the patrici. During my youth, they were a more common sight on the island than they are today, they, together with the coneo, but for most of the youth today, they are an unknown species. They have declined and retreated to the margins of our island. And that brings me to the phenomena of which we conservationists have to deal with, and that's called shifting baselines. And shifting baselines reserves, uh, refers to the changes in our perception of what is considered normal or natural over time, and particularly in the context, context of environmental conditions. This concept is relevant to conservation because it highlights how our expectations of what is healthy uh, what healthy nature looks like uh, changes over generations and often without us really being fully aware of it. If each generation grows up with a slightly degraded environment but considers it normal, then there is a great risk of accepting lower levels of biodiversity as the new baseline. This can lead to a gradual decline in species diversity over time as many people do not recognize or even fully remember the extent of the losses. So if each generation accepts a slightly degraded environment as the norm, future generations will have a lower expectation of what a healthy environment should be. And this can create a cycle of declining environmental quality over time, but also declining biodiversity. So by recognizing and addressing these shifting baselines, conservation efforts can work towards maintaining or restoring the health and resilience of ecosystems for future generations. I am just going to skip through this very briefly, the next slide. This is just to impress on you, uh, if we're talking about conservation challenges, the challenges of FPNA. Um, we have increasingly uh, protected areas brought under our management, which we are very grateful for because they need to be protected. Uh, it does mean that um, in a few years' time span, we have gone from only Arikok National Park to the entire island as our base of nature conservation. So that gives organizational challenges, but we will catch up. Uh, we are an ambitious uh, bunch. Um, so within these areas, we also have very unique uh, areas. We have five key biodiversity areas, and these are sites which are significant to the global persistence of biodiversity. We also have four IBAs for international bird and biodiversity areas um, that, that are wetland areas of international importance according to the Ramsar Convention. We also have four marine protected areas, uh, legally designated as multi-use, but considered K KBAs as well, key biodiversity areas. So in our transitioning as a conservation organization, we are now looking beyond our protected boundaries and management areas as nature knows no boundaries and is interconnected regardless. So anything happening beyond the borders of our management areas has impact on the protected areas and vice versa. So if we look at Aruba's ecosystem services, these are the services that nature provides us as human beings. They are exceptional. And Aruba, even though most people will say there's not that much nature out there, it's still out there and it still does help us as human beings. So if we look at how many ecosystems we have on such a tiny island, it is mind-boggling. 17 ecosystems that also provide habitats for, numerous, uh, for our great biodiversity, and the services that are supporting, provisioning, regulating, uh, but also cultural, aesthetic, which is often forgotten. Nature is also part of our cultural identity. So if we move on to the threats, these are numerous and these are only for, for Aruba, and I think the, the list is increasing. So I will just briefly name them, 
to impress on you the challenges that we as a conservation organization have to deal with on a very regular basis. Climate change, population growth, unsustainable tourism, high impact recreation, unsustainable food resourcing or harvesting, urban development, coastal development, private properties and leased land in protected areas, land clearing, invasive species, feral animals, quarries, landfills, all kinds of pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, solid waste pollution, water pollution by chemicals, sewage pollution, marine pollution. I see noise pollution, light pollution, air pollution, soil, soil degradation, um, and also trash, which I'm sure you've seen as well. So we are operating in a changed landscape. The landscape and vegetation as we know it on Aruba nowadays has changed drastically. So before we look to the future, it is important to briefly pause and understand which processes shaped our island and this island's landscapes and got us to the point where we are now. Since the 1500s, during the centuries when wave after wave of colonists followed Columbus, at least 38 species are known to have disappeared in the Caribbean. In Aruba, the environment began to be impacted during the pre-colonial era, with the first Indian settlers in fishing and farming communities with slash and burn practices, cultivation near the villages, which also led to, to contained deforestation in the areas surrounding their villages. During the colonial era, free roaming herds of grazers were introduced, cattle, goats, sheep, cows and horses were established, and wood was harvested and exported to Europe well into the 19th century, followed by the modest production of export commodity lime, which designated mangroves, as mangroves were needed to burn the kiln ovens. At one point in time, one third of Aruba was cleared for alu cultivation, and numerous agricultural initiatives were undertaken, and by the 20th century, the countryside became barren, and much of the former agricultural lands were, were abandoned. And there was also been periods of drought, Many farmers went to work in oil refinery and the goats were left to roam freely and graze the remaining vegetation on the island. So let's move to a different level, back to a higher global level. All right, I got the yellow card. Okay, I am gonna, I'm gonna go fly through a few slides. So we're now currently in a triple planetary crisis Climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution are running havoc. We are all feeling the impacts of it at an individual level even. So if we look at the uh, regional uh, nature loss, uh, I was just discussing it at the biodiversity level, but at this level, regional, you'll see that we have lost 94% of the original nature in our region. It's extensive, and if you look at the largest uh, cause of this loss, it's actually changes in land use, habitat loss, and degradation. The seven major societal challenges which we are faced today was already discussed briefly in a previous presentation. Nature-based solutions are a tool that we can apply to our standard conservation work that we are already doing at the moment. It gives many, many benefits. Um, I will not name them now but it also has some aspects that are clearly not considered within uh, nature-based solutions. Okay, so if I go, sorry, if I go back, uh, Arno already named a few aspects of what nature-based solutions can mean to us as conservationists. There are numerous projects and programs in which can be invested in which you find a win-win situation for nature, to tackle all the nature threats, as well as have a win for humans. They include protecting and restoring coral reefs, which gives many benefits to humans. Restoring native vegetation, which leads to environmental restoration and also helps humans indirectly. Restoring wetlands and creative constructed wetlands helps us in combating climate change, carbon sequestration, and I can go on. Uh, but we can also look at other ways of using or applying nature-based solutions. For example, restoring the natural watershed, creating riparian buffer zones. So those are zones alongside rivers, for example. 
investing in sustainable agriculture and land use, integrating nature within that. And also, as was discussed before, integrating nature in not only a green in urban infrastructure, but also blue inf urban infrastructure. It gives us many benefits in combating the seven societal challenges that we face today. So what does our sustainable future look like, seeing that the natural environment has been impacted by millennia of, of us being here? and will still be heavily impacted. But for most of the 20th and 21st century, decision makers treated nature as a peripheral to national and global agendas. At best, nature was considered a worthy cause, and at worst, it was an obstacle to development. However, we are now increasingly coming to understand the importance of nature as the basis of our economy and as an essential basis for human existence and well-being. So failure to recognize this is not only the res results in a model, economic growth model that actively destroys nature and its services, it also misses the opportunity to effectively deploy nature in helping resolve major societal challenges such as climate change, food security, and disaster risk reduction. Yes. This is my final slide. I will end with this, hence we need to change our relationship with nature to one which emphasizes interconnectivity, interrelations, and the well-being of the whole. Thank you. Thank you.